Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to church today. I hope you had a great Easter weekend last week and that kids, uh, you've been able to enjoy some school holidays, uh, some downtime, even though you've probably not been able to do the same sorts of things that you normally would. Uh, I'd like to start today by reading some beautiful words from Psalm 34. Uh, I love the beginning of this psalm because it reminds us of the importance of worship. Uh, Psalm 34 verses 1 to 3 say this, I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. My soul will boast in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. Uh, What the psalmist is saying is that uh, when the people of God praise his name, those who are afflicted can hear and rejoice. Those who are suffering will hear the noise of praise and it will lift their souls. For those of you who this morning might be feeling a little flat, a little anxious or stressed, what this psalm is telling us is that one of the best remedies for the afflicted soul is to hear the praise of the Lord. When we hear that sound, it can be like balm for the broken and the wounded. So when songs, worship songs are played each Sunday, whether it's here when we gather physically or now as we're watching from our lounge rooms, I encourage you, don't just think about uh, what these songs mean to you or whether they're helpful just for you. Be aware that there is likely someone else who really needs you to be praising God on their behalf. So we're going to kick off our time together this morning doing exactly that with a song that brings us together in praise of our God, to lift high his name, to recognise all he's done for us, and that even in these weird, lonely and isolated times, we can still say, blessed be your name. Yeah. 
Once again, g'day everybody. Uh, you know, one of the things about regular church that a lot of people really love is the opportunity to connect and to have that sense of community and togetherness. And it's something which probably a lot of us are missing during this time. And so we wanted as a church to recreate that in a couple of different ways. One of those ways we're going to hear from Phil and Shaz in a few minutes. Uh, but firstly, we thought that one opportunity might be that we would start as part of these Sunday releases uh, to create a bit of a chat show uh, and we're calling it chat in the curve uh, just basically a chance to catch up with someone different each week to just see how people are going and just have a bit of light-hearted fun together so the first person that we're going to interview is our mate Andrew Wigger and I should just say that this interview was recorded a couple of weeks ago before Easter and everything um, so there weren't travel restrictions in place at that time. Uh, so, you know, don't worry about any of that sort of thing. Uh, I think that's about it. So let's roll the intro video. Going. How are you going? Good, how are you? I'm well. Good, good. Yeah, yeah. Welcome to Chan the Curve, my new talk show. Good to have you on. <laughs> Thank you. It's yeah. a shame I'm not on the green couch, you see. Yeah, I know this is but well, it's not 1.5 meters long, otherwise I would have had you on it. <laughs> my, I guess, biggest question is just how are you guys all doing with all the COVID stuff and the lockdown and all that different thing? What's life like for the Wiggins family at the moment? Yeah, I mean, like like most people, it's definitely changed. Um, Health-wise, we're going really well. Um, if anything, we're probably, well, more me. Patina was uh, a gym junkie, so she's not doing that. But um, but uh, I'm definitely making a habit of trying to get out walking. And, yeah. Uh, so we've been going for more walks together than what we would have previously. Yeah, yeah. And I'm certainly seeing a lot more other people around the neighbourhood. Now, I see Kay and Tony walking around all over the place very, yeah. very regularly. The boys go for a run. We try and get them because they're in the house all day. They go out for a, for a jog around the block. Um, but I guess biggest thing is, um, uh, I guess because our work is considered, both of our works are considered essential services, we're still going in where a lot of people are um, uh, at home. Yeah, right. um, some hearing clinics have already closed their doors. I know there's been quite a few. Um, we've decided to just keep going as long as we're, you know, meeting all the requirements for hygiene and and uh, yeah. social spacing and all of that sort of stuff. And hey, on the weekend, you had a special event. On oh, yes. Phone. Yeah. 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 Halfway there, mate. Halfway <laughs> there. I couldn't believe it. You've turned 50 on the weekend. You've only gone and turned Yeah. 50. Well, I had some uh, very thoughtful friends um, <laughs> do a drive-by birthday, which totally took me by surprise. I had no idea. But, yeah. Um, uh, Patina had just said, why don't we go out the front and have a drink and uh, have some nibbles and we'll 
sit and watch the, uh, the boys. I'm going to do some uh, driveway cricket, just uh, muck around. And um, so I was sitting there, I thought, this is nice. I got up to take a photo and I heard horns beeping. <laughs> And I turned down, I looked down the street and there's there's a, a series of cars um, driving up the street with banners saying happy yeah. happy birthday. And uh, that was awesome because yeah, yeah. Yeah, to think people went to the trouble of, of getting in their cars and and and, um, and driving past was, <laughs> it meant a great deal. Yeah. And, and Mr. Treat was very funny. I, seeing him jump out of the car, spraying himself with Glen 20 and... Uh, <laughs> And th and throwing a, throwing a gift on the grass, spraying that with Glen Twenty, and then jumping quickly back in the car and driving. That's great. The other thing I wanted to ask you about is I saw a picture on Facebook. That photo I think you're referring to was uh, me giving blood. I think. Yeah. That that. So was that your first time oh. in blood? Is that right? Was that the caption on it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's my first time. I've got a mate who's um who does it, has done it every twelve weeks for I don't know how many years. And uh, I always kept meaning to, to go and do it and um, finally thought, okay. <laughs> Patina went along too and we, um, we just booked it online and uh, someone had said, oh, make sure people still give blood because mm. quite often in this sort of circumstance, people don't, it's not the first thing on their mind. So yeah. I thought we'd go and do it. Thanks heaps for joining me today, Wig. It's been good to catch up and good to have a bit of a laugh and just see your face and um yeah, glad to no be worries. going all right for you guys over there. Thank you, my pleasure. Yeah, it's um, it's really it's it's when we get to Sunday, I'm really enjoying seeing all the faces. Yeah. You know, like we said before, it makes you realise I think you, things you take for granted. So to mm. to sit, be able to scroll through and uh, see all everyone sitting at home watching it's been really good. So even yeah. though it's not as good as being with each other, but yeah, yeah, hopefully not too much longer. We'll see. We'll get through That's it. Right. Yeah. Okay, awesome. mate. Thanks, thanks for joining me today, mate. It's been good. You too. Okay, mate. All Thank right, you. Take care. Bye. Well, it's basically been a month now since we've met together um, and of course one of the things uh, we all cherish is the opportunity to connect in this space after the service and to share our lives, to share our stories, to grab a cup of coffee uh, and enjoy that time together. So we're going to start a new thing on Zoom after our live stream each Sunday called the Courtyard Cafe because this is usually where we hang and just connect together. So we're going to try and recreate that in our own homes and to do that it might mean offering your spouse a coffee. Oh yeah, you want a coffee? Yes. Okay, I'll go and Okay, get flat white, thank you. Awesome, thank you. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you. I think the uh, barista was flirting with me a bit there. I highly doubt that. So if you really want to recreate this courtyard cafe that we usually experience after church, there's a few things you could do. You could as you, yeah, get a coffee for your family. You could spell their name a little bit wrong. Sometimes that happens at church as well or at other cafes, doesn't it? You could have small children run beneath your coffee and nearly spill it. And you can get as many biscuits as you like from your own kitchen. So Go some... crazy kids, as many as you want. <laughs> so there, we can make it feel pretty real, but we will have yeah, a special time, very live, very raw, very casual after the service. So get on Zoom, we really want you to be there so that we are still connecting face to face um, each Sunday. Yeah, but of course that can only do so much. We still need to be uh, connecting with each other in between Sundays. So just keep calling one another, open the church directory, um, make a phone call or even connect over Zoom. We had a, a dinner party the other night with another couple of people uh, over Zoom. It was great. Um, uh, as much as you can do to keep connecting with one another, caring for one another and also seeking how you can connect with your community as well. And one important way of doing that is our one plus one food aid initiative. Yeah, this is a great opportunity just to help families within our community who are doing it tough. So it's very simple. When you're at the shops, you buy one thing that you need for yourself and buy another for a family who are, who are struggling. So, or a, or yeah, or a person living alone. So. Those things are non-perishable food items and even cleaning products and hygiene items. Those normal family grocery um, items, we just want to all just start putting together what will become a hamper and will bless people who um, really need it at the moment. There's so many people who 
yeah, are in a different situation than they may normally be. So um, we really thank you for your generosity. There has been just so many amazing bags of really valuable um, food and products for people and they've gone out already to people who have needed it. So we, we are, thank you for that, but let's keep it going as times continue to be tough for so many in our community. Yeah. Uh, so we'll see you after the service in our metaphorical courtyard cafe. Looking forward to it. Good morning everyone, my name's Lou and I'm the kids and families pastor here at Greenpoint Baptist Church. Just a special welcome to our families and our children today. We want to remind you again that we miss you, I know I say it all the time, but we miss you, we miss your smiling faces and we wish we could all be together, but I'm so glad to be able to, yes, talk to you today. Just a quick little explanation, In the next, over the next little while we're going to be starting a new series on the book of Luke. And um, we want to encourage and resource our families to be, yeah, encouraging their children through our church sermons to be engaging as well with a sermon. So we've made some little resources that will come up on the screen in a minute. Firstly, for our younger children, we have some colouring in on the book of Luke. There's a few pictures in there that will relate to some of the stories that you'll hear over the coming weeks. Encourage them to sit with you, get the colouring pencils out and enjoy doing that. And um, there's also a page that talks a little bit about the book of Luke, which you might be able to read to your younger children. But when you listen to the sermon today, listen to Will, you uh, might like to draw a picture of what you think Luke might have looked like. So have a go at, at drawing your Lukes and you might be able to share them with us later and send in a photo of your pictures. And um, for our older kids, so kids probably primary school and up, uh, I thought it would be a great idea to think about listening to the sermon and having a little mind map. So maybe drawing uh, the word Luke in the centre of the page and putting some ideas around as you listen to the sermon, write some ideas around about who Luke is and um, little things that you've found out about him um, through the sermon. So have a go at doing that today too. And also there is a family or a children's Bible reading plan through the book of Luke. So you might like to take a look at that. It's all in the resource package and in the email that I sent out to families this week. Also in that email, there was a little encouragement to families to be dis using this time to intentionally disciple your children. So I just wanted to encourage you with that again today. Uh, what things are you working into your um, life to be yeah, sharing God's word with your children and praying together? Um, yeah, just lots of different things. I, I want to encourage you to have another look at Deuteronomy 6, uh, 4 to 7. It talks about having those God conversations, talking about Jesus when you are walking along the road, when you're at home, when you're lying down, when you're sitting up. So can I encourage you to work in talking about God, make it a natural part of your family's life together. Also, uh, we would love to do another challenge. So last week we did the Easter egg roll challenge. So we've got another challenge for our families to be part of today. Uh, for next Sunday service. So can I encourage you to think of something, each of you, to think of something that you are thankful to God for. And you can film your family saying, I'm thankful to God for, and then you can fill in the rest. Um, yeah, get each family member to share something, record it on a video and send it in to Will, and he can um, put them all together so that we can hear a whole lot of thanksgiving to God from our little members and also older members of our church family that we can put together and be an encouragement to everyone for next week. So get them into Will by Wednesday so that we can edit them all together. I think that's it from the kids part. I'm going to pray now for the rest of the service. So join me as we pray. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you that you are with us today, that whether we are meeting together in person or over um, Zoom or over Facebook, Lord, that we know that your presence is everywhere, that you are with us. So we thank you for that. We ask that you would help us today to be engaged and to have our ears and our hearts open to whatever it is you want to say to us today. Help us to be receptive to your Holy Spirit. I pray uh, that you would yeah, continue to encourage us through this time of isolation to be thinking of ways that we can love one another, that we can um, love and glorify and honour you and that we can bless our communities. I pray that, yeah, that you would keep giving us ideas and ways to 
uh, love and bless people that are in our worlds. We pray particularly for people that are healthcare workers, that are doctors and people researching our, the virus at the moment. I pray that you would give them wisdom, that you will protect them and that they would um, yeah, know your peace and presence through this time. We lift up people that might be feeling particularly lonely today. We ask that you would help them to know uh, a special sense of your presence with them, that you would um, yeah, help them to know that they are loved. And um, Lord, if you are prompting us to be connecting with people, we pray that you would yeah, just continue to lay on our hearts people that you want us to connect with so that we can be a blessing um, and show your love into their lives. We thank you that you are with us and we pray that you would yeah, continue to help us to learn and grow to become more like Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us. Just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. With this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. G'day everybody, welcome again to church this morning. My name's Will, it's great to be able to be here. You know what, actually that intro's a bit lame. I'm gonna try that again. Hey guys, my name's Will. So glad that you could join us today. Did I say glad? Greetings and salutations. No. So I walk into the pet store and I say to the shopkeep, five bees please. But he gives me six bees. And I say, well, what's this sixth one for? And he says, oh, that's a freebie. I'll save the jokes for Bob. Greetings, children. No, that's probably, <laughs> that's too much of me. Hey guys. Uh... Oh, hey guys. Um, so, we're going to look at the... Um, no, it's not quite it. Hey guys. Um, yeah, I can try that one again. I don't know, I just need the perfect intro. Um, I've got it. Well, there you go. I finally nailed my sweet intro. And if you're a little unsure why I bothered to do a bunch of different introductions, hopefully through the message it'll become clear if it hasn't already. Uh, if in about 15 minutes time you still don't know why I did it, um, I'll explain it to you. You can message me or something like that. Uh, but for now, I want you to think about some of the best-selling books of all time. Uh, one of my favorite books uh, when I was going through high school was any of Dan Brown's books, but in particular, The Da Vinci Code, which has had over 80 million copies sold worldwide. Uh, some other classics include Lewis Carroll's Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, more than 100 million copies sold. And maybe one of the best books of all time would be The Lord of the Rings by J.R.R. Tolkien, over 150 million copies sold. But when you think about the top books, the best-selling books of all time, you might know that they all pale in comparison to the number one best-selling book of all time, which is the Bible. The Bible has had over five billion copies either sold or distributed, given away for free. 
And in fact, when they put together the list of the best-selling book of the year, they always have to remove the Bible from the list. Otherwise, it would just win best-selling book of the year every year. Uh, the Bible has been translated into over a thousand different languages. And not only is it a very popular book, I think it'd be fair to say it's also a pretty influential and significant book as well. I can't think of any other book. I'm not sure I can think of any other person um, or moment in history, event in history, that has had as significant an impact on our world as the Bible has. And not only is the Bible an incredibly popular and significant book, but it is, of course, also the most illegal book, the one which more than any other book has been banned and stolen and confiscated more than any other book. Even today, there are many places in the world where owning a Bible or being caught with a Bible could land you in prison or even worse. And I guess the question when you think about it is what is all the fuss about? Isn't it just a book? What is it that makes the Bible so significant and popular and dangerous? Or a question that I get asked pretty often would be, what makes the Bible unique? Doesn't it really just come down to, you know, you believe what you believe, I believe what I believe. Maybe you've got your book, I've got my book. Who's to say whether one is right and one is wrong? Well, over the next couple of months, uh, together as a church, whether it's online or whether we get to meet back here at some point, who knows? But we're going to be going through uh, a particular part of the Bible. We're going to be going through the Gospel of Luke. And Luke is one of the four Gospels uh, which form a really important part of the Bible for Christians. Uh, Christians often come back to the four Gospels because they recount the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus, which really is kind of the centerpiece of the Christian faith. You know, after Jesus left, uh, the disciples were going around telling everyone about all these different amazing things that had happened, that they'd seen and been a part of. Uh, but they were doing more than just telling people what they'd seen. Uh, they were actually showing people the amazing power that the Holy Spirit had given them to continue to do miracles. So they weren't just telling people about Jesus' power, they were showing them Jesus' power. And even though at the time of the early church, it was highly illegal and dangerous to be a Christian, both the Romans and the Jewish leaders wanted to get rid of Christianity. They wanted to snuff it out once and for all. Uh, Christianity actually continued to spread and to spread like wildfire. But eventually these disciples who were going around uh, telling the things that they'd seen, doing these amazing miracles through the power of the Holy Spirit, eventually they were getting old and they knew that they weren't going to be around forever. They weren't going to be around to continue to tell people and show people forever. And so they said, we need to write these things down, all these different things that we've seen and witnessed and been a part of. And so that's why the four Gospels, these four accounts, these eyewitness testimonies about Jesus' life were written. Now, as I said, today we're going to be looking at Luke, or through the next couple of months we're going to be looking at Luke. We're just looking at the introduction today. So what do we know about this guy, Luke? What do we know about the guy who wrote this book? Well, he wasn't one of Jesus' 12 original disciples. Uh, he, like Mark, was someone who became involved later on. Uh, scholars have pointed out when you read through the book of Luke, you look at the language that it's written in. It's written in a very formal kind of Greek. And that says to us that Luke was probably a very well-educated man. And this is supported by what else we know about Luke, which is that Luke was a physician. He was a doctor. That was his job. And we get a bit more of a picture uh, from who Luke 
is and how he was connected to all of this when we read through his introduction. So let's have a read of it together again. It's only four verses. Luke chapter 1, verses 1 to 4. Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who, from the first, were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. With this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. So what we learn there is that Luke was actually writing this book for somebody else, for a man named Theophilus. And Theophilus was a high-ranking Roman official who had heard all these different reports about Jesus and about his followers, about his alleged dying and coming back to life. And he wanted to know whether any of it was true. And so Luke is sort of given this task, given this job of going and investigating. That's the word that Luke himself uses, investigating these things and coming back and reporting to Theophilus what he finds. It's almost like he kind of takes off his doctor's hat and puts on his detective cap uh, and he goes around and collects all different sorts of eyewitness reports and testimonies and he compiles together all these different witnesses and statements. And for me, this is just one of the things that makes the Bible so unique, so distinctly different from any other book. When it spends this time really going into detail about who wrote it, why it was written, and how it was composed. And not just the detail that it goes into, but the support that we have from the rest of history and other sources as well. One of the things that you'll notice is a major difference between the Christian faith and other faiths, between the Bible and other sacred books, is where the information comes from. And one simple way of thinking about it is this. Almost every other sacred book comes from information which you might say is private. It might be one person who feels like they've had some sort of spiritual supernatural encounter or moment and then they after that private moment nobody else there to see it come away and they write it down and they tell other people and then other people start to believe it and follow it as well or maybe it's not even this spiritual encounter maybe it's just kind of an epiphany or an enlightenment that they've experienced themselves that they then go and they write down and share with other people but the bible is so incredibly different to that the Bible is an incredibly different book because it's not just, in fact, one book. The Bible is actually 66 different books written over a span of a thousand years by around 40 different people in different countries, in different languages that all tell the same story. And most of it isn't about these private spiritual moments or these private epiphanies or enlightenments. Most of it is just people reporting, this is what I saw, this is what we saw happening, this is what we know. Maybe there are some people wondering, well, how do we know that these people really wrote the Bible? How do we know that this isn't just someone else who says, oh yeah, I'm a disciple of Jesus, and they write down their reports? In fact, I was having a conversation with someone just earlier this year, a couple of months ago, who was insistent that the Bible was written hundreds of years later by people who, who were just sort of making it all up, uh, that these weren't real eyewitnesses, people who had no credibility, um, just maybe writing under these fake names, and they couldn't tell me exactly how they were convinced of this or why they were convinced of it, but they just were certain of it. They, were, they knew that for sure that was what was true. So how do we know that these really were people who were witnesses? How do we know that this really is who Luke is and that that really is who Matthew was and John was? Well, the first thing when you're establishing who wrote something that a historian will look for is what we call primary evidence. And that's just something really simple. Does, are there clues within the text as to who wrote it? 
And it's very clear when you read through the Gospels and different parts of the Bible that there is really strong primary evidence uh, that supports, for example, Luke, that Luke really was this doctor, this guy who joined the Christian movement partway through within the text. So, but that, that could all be made up. Apart from primary evidence, we look for secondary evidence. Are there other historians from the same time that support, that actually say, yes, that is who wrote the book? And we actually do have secondary evidence. We actually have a couple of other historians who say these books were written by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and they tell us more information about who each of those guys is. They confirm for us that these really were written by eyewitnesses. And alongside that primary and secondary evidence, there's other stuff that supports it as well. We have really strong corroborating evidence through history. My friend that I was having this conversation with who was adamant that these were written hundreds of years later by people who had nothing to do with it, just making it all up, one of the things that he was saying is that the original Jesus, you know, probably just was a really cool guy, had some really great sayings, um, and these ideas that he was the son of God and that he died and came back from the dead. These were all ideas that came much later. No one at the time actually thought that. Those were ideas from hundreds of years later that just sort of almost like this crept into the story, this sort of mythologizing that happened over time. That each time the story was passed on, it got more and more kind of fantastic down the line. But what we actually know from a whole ton of corroborating evidence is that that's not the case at all. We actually have a lot of writings from different Jewish and Roman historians who wrote about Christians, and these are people who didn't like the Christians. Uh, these are historians who, when they're writing about Christians, actually they have a lot of negative things to say, but they made it really clear what the Christians were going around and saying, and that is that Christians were going around saying We've seen a man die and come back from the dead. We've seen this man, Jesus, and they give a whole bunch of information about what the Christians are saying that shows that this wasn't information that was added later or there's something that evolved down the track. This from the very beginning was the Christian message, what people who knew Jesus and were witnesses to all of it were going around and teaching. And finally, perhaps the nail in the coffin of any doubt about these sorts of things is that we can actually rule out any ideas that these texts might be pseudepigraphy. And pseudepigraphy is where an author pretends to be somebody else from earlier in history. We can rule that out because we actually do have very early manuscripts of these gospels that show that they were written far too early to be pseudepigraphy. These were actually written at the time the eyewitnesses were still alive and still walking around. That if these things were written that weren't by the people who they say that they were, they could have been so easily uh, disproven and discarded rather than circulated widely like they were. Now all of these different things really are just skimming the surface of what is a pretty big topic. And for some people maybe hearing this, because we've only just been able to dip into it. Maybe you're filled with more questions or even with disagreement or wanting to know more. The reality is it's impossible to say everything on this topic in such a short time. But let me encourage you, if you have questions about this stuff, don't hold on to them. I don't, nobody expects us to hear these things and just believe it or to accept it. Uh, Jesus never encouraged people to have blind faith. That's in fact why the Bible is so different and so remarkable. But take those questions and I'd love to talk to you about them. You could either contact me, you could contact somebody from church. Let's chat about those things together. But I guess my final thought on this, I know the whole thing feels like an introduction, that's because we're looking at an introduction, but my final thought on all of this 
is that as we go over the next couple of months on this journey through Luke, as we see reports of amazing things, um, some incredible miracles that are performed, miraculous things happening, as well as Jesus saying some really radical and history-shaping things, I really hope that this is an encouragement for us, that what we're reading isn't just some private epiphany or something that we're expected to just swallow or believe, but that we are actually reading the reports of people who were there, people who saw these things, people who were a part of these things, people who had their lives completely changed and who invite us to be a part of that movement, to have our lives changed for the better as well.
Well, thanks for joining us today everyone it's been great to worship together and to uh, get into god's word uh, if you are on zoom and you want to hang around for our courtyard cafe then stick around uh, take a few minutes grab a cup of coffee and we'll see you shortly if you're watching on facebook and you'd like to join us in that courtyard cafe uh, then just shoot us a message uh, and we'll respond to you with the zoom details uh, have a great week uh, and we'll see you next week god bless